Youth subcultures. Youth is present only when its presence is a problem or is regarded as a problem. Dick Hebridge. Okay, and you know this is true. Suddenly, if people perceive youth as a problem, then they start looking at them in more detail. As Geoffrey Pearson shows, adolescents have continually been seen as a social problem since at least the mid 19th century. Groups such as the, the Peaky Blinders emerged in the 1880s, and anti Nazi youth cultures even existed in wartime Germany, the Edelweiss Pirates. As a distinct social group, however, youth only became an important sociological concern in the 1950s. And remember we talked earlier about whether childhood was a, a social construct, and therefore we have to consider whether youth is a social construct as well. Because previously people may have been going out to work when they were younger, and so this idea of youth has developed over time. So it's only once we come into the 1950s that actually it becomes a big sociological issue. The main focus has been on the concept of subculture, a group with its own norms, values, leisure pursuits and sometimes even a uniform, coexisting within mainstream culture. The supposed disrespect for authority and conventional morality and the sometimes illegal and organised activities of these groups have also led to intense media attention and the labelling as modern day folk devils of groupings such as Ted's, Mods, Rockers, Skinheads and Punks in Britain and Hell's Angels in America. So often the media actually blow out of proportion what is happening within these groups and the, and the influence they have and the bad things that they are doing. Youth subcultures take shape around the distinctive activities and focal concerns of particular youth groups. They can be loosely or tightly bound. Some subcultures are merely loosely defined strands of milieu within the parent culture. Sorry, lost my place. They possess no distinctive world of their own. Okay, so it could be a very sort of loosely bound group who, who of people who just kind of rub along together because they all live within one area or something. Others develop a clear, coherent identity and structure. Some youth subcultures are regular and persistent features of the parent class culture, the culture of delinquency, of the working class adolescent male, for example. But others appear only at particular historical moments. They become visible or identified and labelled either by themselves or by others. They command the stage of public attention for a time, then they fade, disappear, or are so widely diffused that they lose their distinctiveness. Okay, so these groups don't seem to have any real sort of long standing and longevity. Distinctive though they are, however, it is important to realise that youth subcultures continue to coexist with the more inclusive culture of the class from which they originate. Members of a subculture may act and look different from their parents and from some of their peers, but they belong to the same families, went to the same schools, do similar jobs and live down the same street as their peers and parents. So they still don't tend to revolt so much in that way. It might be, it might be ideological revolt in that they think in different ways, that they want to be better educated. Now, it doesn't have to be negative all the time. As uh, Mungham and Pearson observe, behind all the talk of generation and generation gap, there is the uh, forgotten question of the class structure of society. It is as if when youth are discussed that social class goes on holiday, but youth is not a classless tribe. Okay, so because you've been brought up within a certain class, um, then there are acceptable things that you do and things that you are used to doing. Um, and so therefore that's not actually going to change, even though you're slightly rebellious as a, as a part of the youth group. So explanations for youth subcultures. Explanations for youth behaviour and lifestyles encompass many areas, from peer group formation to pluralism, from increasing social mobility to changing class structure, from the extension of the school leaving age to the emergence of a distinct youth labour market, and from new patterns of consumerism to the very fact of age itself. This latter approach is the one taken by S. N. Einstadt who, looking at youth from a functionalist point of view, argues that a distinct phase of life is necessary in society to allow the transition from the particularistic values of the home to the universalistic values of the rest of society. So, you know, as a, a child leaves their family surroundings and their home, where they are very much the centre of everything, they have to come out into this universal, whole, big, wide world. Uh, as they grow older. 
The phenomenon of youth and youth cultures is society's solution to this problem of transition. If conflict exists, it is essentially emotional and results from young people's sense of marginalisation and powerlessness while developing their values and relationships that allow them to stand on their own two feet. The main point is that youth cultures are functional to society and in fact help maintain social order. So we need to have youths who are uh, growing up, um, standing on their own two feet, developing their own opinions because that's how society moves forward and it's a part of the structure and then they will move on to make those decisions to become uh, husbands and wives or to become entrepreneurs or to become parents. The obvious point that not all young people experience the transition to adulthood in the same way and that some people are more marginalised and powerless than others was made by American subcultural theorists from Albert Cohen onwards. As youth and youth cultures were further investigated, dimensions of class, ethnicity and gender, as well as of age, were also developed. Because not everybody goes through a rebellion. Some people just move through their life in steady stages. In the mid-1970s, the Birmingham-based Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies examined the links between the youth, class, pop culture and social life. Uh, for example, Hall and Jefferson. Focusing mainly on working class youth, they argued that youth cultures were attempts to solve problems, not necessarily of age, but which affected the working class as a whole. Simply put, the old values of hard work and pride in the job were being challenged by the new consumer affluence. As old traditional communities disappeared, young people tried to re-establish working class values in their own way. The search for a uniform style and the links with certain types of music were all interwoven in a complex way. These are not real solutions to the social problems, but magical ways to deal with them. Strange clothes, teddy boys Edward and dress, skinheads braces and boots, mod suits and parkas and stripy trousers and Doc Martins of the grunge generation of the early 1990s. And conflict, with par and conflict with parents are seen as ways of coming to terms with the problems of forming an identity against a rapidly changing class and cultural backdrop. Okay, so yes, um, you know, young people are going through those same problems that they always have, but society is changing as well, and their way to solve problems is to is to have some sort of magical. Um, solution, uh, which is to dress differently, to show a, an area of, of rebellion, but also to show that they have values still. Okay, so to have pride in your job and the work that you do kind of went downhill a little bit in the 1990s because people became very affluent and so it was all about what you could buy and how much money you could make. So this is the youth trying to say, well, okay, we're fitting into that. Uh, we're, we are affluent, we can wear different clothes and, and look how we display ourselves uh, by doing so. A central question asked by these writers concerns the extent to which youth cultures can be seen as a form of resistance to the dominant culture, gaining cultural space to call their own. The concept of hegemony, which was discussed earlier in this chapter, most closely associated with the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci, is central here. Youth subcultures, by the fact of their very existence and the symbolic messages they transmit, threaten the dominant ideology, punching holes in the hegemony. So they're trying to fight against um, you know, the traditional ways of doing things. That doesn't mean they're negative, they could be good ways of moving forward. The most distinctive youth cultures take over and claim symbols for themselves, whether it is a Lambretta scooter, an old man's vehicle before the mods got hold of it, skinheads in workman's boots, or punks with safety pins through their noses. Okay, so the same things we've talked about already. Other writers have not seen youth cultures in the same romantic way. What appears as resistance can equally well be seen as an elaborate way of acquiescing to the dominant ideology. So actually it could be that they're going along with the ideology. Resistance through ritualistic leisure pursuits does not really solve the problems of poor education and unemployment. The ability of youth cultures to resist dominant values is severely limited and their artefacts are soon taken over by commercial interests and turned into mass market consumer items. Any political ideology can effectively use youth groups to further their ends, as with the extreme right and the harnessing of skinheads across Europe. Furthermore, by focusing on the most identifiable youth groups, 
uh, sorry, youth cultures, the ordinariness of growing up for most young people remains unexamined. The majority of young people don't join youth cultures, and why is that? Why don't we look at that? And these youth cultures can be manipulated because they're not ideologically based, they're just trying to change things slightly. McRobbie and Garber ask whether girls do not appear in subcultural studies because of the sexism of mainstream sociology or because there are no female youth subcultures. Their answer is the latter. The culture of femininity, which places a high value on passivity and allows girls less free time, marginalises them into the position of onlookers, reading romantic magazines and thinking about boys. Girls escape into fantasy rather than rebel. If they do resist, it's by acting in a male way or by getting pregnant. So no subcultures for girls in that sense then, although of course there have, has been this rise of ladettes in, in recent time. Later research by Sue Lees confirms most of this argument, showing how the behaviour and attitudes of adolescent girls continue to be seen in terms of male opinion. For example, their behaviour is controlled by the use of pejorative labels like slag. So a boy that sleeps with a lot of girls is a stud, but a girl that does that same thing is a slag. So the way that, it, that they are labelled by males makes a difference to the way that they behave. Black youth is a largely under-researched area of the sociology of youth, yet whether it is as rude boys in the 1960s, whose style was partly copied by mods and the earlier skinheads, or as rasters in the 1970s and 1980s, they have made crucial contributions to the definition of youth subcultures. Rastafarianism, with its view of white civilization as Babylon, is closer to a counterculture than it is to a subculture, okay? and it has had longevity, and it is really trying to reject something and to set up its own culture. Berger argues that youth culture has little to do with youth. He puts forward the hypothesis that what we are in the habit of calling youth culture is a creation of the not so young. He suggests that the kind of behaviour associated with this phrase is in fact more typical of certain occupations, bohemian business, show business and some working class occupations than of adolescents. Certainly there appear to be in people's minds very clear stereotypes of what pop singers are like and the assumption is frequently made that if pop singers engage in deviant behaviour their followers will copy them. So behaviour seen to be typical of certain groups in the population comes to be associated with that of some adolescents. Okay, so Berger is saying actually it's not the young people that are doing it. Okay, it, they're just copying other people, uh, following uh, things that pop stars are doing, uh, because they idolise them. The stereotype is characterised by irresponsibility, but adolescence is related less to the irresponsible nature of adolescent roles and more to a lack of appropriate roles. Adolescents are seen as being irresponsible in the negative sense that they do not play adult roles, rather than because they play roles that are specifically irresponsible. Okay? And they're, they're adolescents, so they shouldn't have to be adults at this point. Yet, they are legally and socially prevented from adopting many responsible adult roles. The stereotyping process has important implications for changes in patterns of adolescent behaviour. So we expect adolescents to start becoming young adults, Okay, but actually they're not allowed to be young adults because there are many things that they're barred from doing. How adults regard adolescents will influence their interpretation of what adolescents are doing and therefore the way in which they interact with them. If it is believed that adolescents are irresponsible, people tend to highlight that part of their behaviour that has an irresponsible element. In this way, labelling procedures are brought to bear upon adolescents in situations of contact. Associations between the stereotypes of adolescents in general and stereotypes relating to various deviant adolescent groups may result in adults attaching deviant labels to adolescents in general. Consequently, the young may find themselves increasingly being pressed into deviant roles. In a sense, then, the youth culture is artificially created. Okay, so um, adults put these labels onto adolescents. They then treat those adolescents in a different way because of the labels that they put onto them. And so in, as a response to that, the adolescents do deviant things and, and therefore this um, youth culture is perpetuated uh, and created artificially by adults and the labels that they give to adolescents. 
Little has been said about youth culture in recent years, partly because of scarce funding, but also, as many sociologists have argued, because there is perhaps little more to say. The spectacular subcultures of the 1950s and 1960s are now impossible. Wider groups than working class young people have appropriated subcultural styles, particularly for marketing purposes. While the declining numbers of young people in the West, youth unemployment and homelessness and increasing numbers of adolescents in full-time education have removed the social basis for distinctive youth cultures, could it be, as Mark Abrams argued in early 1959, that a teenager is now little more than a marketing category? So, actually, youth sub, uh, subcultures have really kind of disappeared, okay, because youth are being channeled into lots of different things. And, uh, you know, to uh, if you look at the number of magazines that are available for teenagers, you look at the range of clothing that's available for teenagers, it has kind of become a marketing category as opposed to a real subculture.